Our scripture reading this evening is from the book of 2 Kings. And it's actually chapter 1. There's a little uh, mistake in the bulletin. Whenever I put the bulletin together, I actually skipped an entire section of Elijah's life. And I thought, I just can't do that. So I went back to fill in the gaps and we'll finish up with the next sermon and when Elijah is taken up. So we'll save that reading for the next time. But this evening we're going to look at uh, 2 Kings chapter 1. We'll read the entire chapter. And pay careful attention as this also will be the text of the message. Moab rebelled against Israel after the death of Ahab. Now Ahaziah fell through the lattice of his upper room in Samaria and was injured. So he sent messengers and said to them, Go inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, whether I shall recover from this injury. But the angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite, Arise, go up and meet the messengers of the king of Samaria and say to them, is it because there is no God in Israel that you are going to inquire of Beelzebub, the God of Ekron? Now therefore, thus says the Lord, you shall not come down from the bed to which you have gone up, but you shall surely die. So Elijah departed. And when the messengers returned to him, he said to them, Why have you come back? So they said to him, A man came up to meet us and said to us, Go return to the king who sent you and say to him, Thus says the Lord, it is, is it because there is no God in Israel that you are sending to inquire of Beelzebub, the God of Ekron? Therefore you shall not come down from the bed to which you have gone up, but you shall surely die. Then he said to them, What kind of man was it who came up to meet you and told you these words? So they answered him, A hairy man wearing a leather belt around his waist. And he said, It is Elijah the Tishbite. Then the king sent him, sent to him a captain of fifty with his fifty men. So he went to him, and there he was sitting on top of a hill. And he spoke to him, Man of God, the king has said, Come down. So Elijah answered and said to the captain of fifty, If I am a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your fifty men. And fire came down from heaven and consumed him and his fifty. Then he sent to him another captain of fifty with his fifty men. And he answered and said to him, Man of God, thus has the king said, Come down quickly. So Elijah answered and said to them, If I am a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your fifty men. And the fire of God came down from heaven and consumed him and his fifty. Again, he sent a third captain of fifty with his fifty men. And the third captain of fifty went up and came and fell on his knees before Elijah and pleaded with him and said to him, Man of God, please let my life and the life of these fifty servants of yours be precious in your sight. Look, fifty, or fire has come down from heaven and burned up the first two captains of fifties with their fifties. But let my life now be precious in your sight. And the angel of the Lord said to Elijah, Go down with him. Do not be afraid of him. So he arose and went down with him to the king. And he said to him, Thus says the Lord, Because you have sent messengers to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, is it because there is no god in Israel to inquire of his word? Therefore you shall not come down from the bed to which you have gone up, but you shall surely die. So Ahaziah died according to the word of the Lord, which Elijah had spoken. Because he had no son, Jehoram became king in his place. In the second year of Jehoram, the son of Jehoash, uh, Jehoshaphat, the king of, of Judah. Now the rest of the acts of Ahaziah which he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings, kings of Israel? And let us pray. Heavenly Father, we now open your word and we look into the story of Elijah and Lord, we pray that you would help us to glean the lessons which are there and prepare us, Lord, for 
our own Christian lives as we live in this age. Help us to learn the lessons of the past and from your word, that we may apply them, that we might better glorify you and be a better testimony to those around us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We left off, if you remember, with Elijah. Once again, challenging the king, that would be King Ahab, and through, through, who through the evil craftiness of his wife had been complicit in the murder of his neighbor. Uh, if you remember, his neighbor Naboth owned a vineyard beside Ahab's house, and Ahab decided that he wanted that, offered to buy it, Naboth said, I can't do that because it is my inheritance and I'm forbidden to sell it to you uh, through the law of God. And Ahab went and, and pouted. Uh, he had just left a great victory, but because he had been disobedient, he had God's curse upon him. There was judgment coming upon him. And he had been downtrodden. He thought, well, I'll, I'll buy this, this vineyard. that will make me happy. But he couldn't do that. And so he went and he was in a state of depression. His wife had stepped in. She took over, arranged a fraud trial, in which, which goes to show that fraud trials are nothing new. The enemy has always used the law system to get to do his bidding, uh, to be the destruction of a nation or the destruction of God's people. They will use whatever they, they have at their disposal, whether it, it be the courts of law, whatever. That's what happened here. Uh, the Naboth was put to death and his, his sons. Uh, Ahab took possession, and as he was coming down to take possession of this vineyard, which his wife had gotten for him, he was met by none other than Elijah, the Tishbite, the prophet. And Elijah gave him the prophecy that where the dogs licked up the blood of Naboth, where they had murdered Naboth, uh, the dogs came and they would lick up the blood, a horrible thing, that the dogs will lick your blood. And not only that, but Jezebel is going to have uh, her blood uh, 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 being consumed by the dogs as well, or eaten, eaten by the dogs. Uh, so we have that um, Ahab then went out to war. He tried to hide himself. I don't know if I mentioned that last time, but he tried to hide himself. Je Jehoshaphat, the king of, of Judah, went with him, and the enemy had decided, we're going to go after Ahab and just him, and they mis mistook Jehoshaphat for Ahab and they went after him and he cries out and they say oh that's the wrong guy we need to go find him they never did find Ahab but at a, a man had taken a random shot with, a, with an arrow and, and it landed between the, the armor of the, the joints of the armor of Ahab and he bled to death and the chariot was taken back to Jezreel it was washed and the dogs came there and licked up his blood and that was the end of Ahab and his son then took the throne his son Ahaziah which we read about here in 2 Kings chapter 1 what we find out with Ahaziah sometimes you know you can a, a child may learn from the sins of their parents you know some of us many of us at my age in particular everybody smoked back in the day you know I mean it was just the thing to do I mean uh, the the doctors were, were saying, this is the best kind of cigarettes to use. I mean, that was the medical field just about, what, 60 years ago, 70 years ago. You've, we still had commercials on TV for, many of us remember that, for, for cigarettes. You know, uh, however, like my, myself growing up under that and having to deal with it, I thought, I don't ever want to smoke. You know, it was just, to me, it turned my stomach, it made me sick, and I had to deal with it all my life. I thought, I'm not going to put my children through that, and so... You know, I, I just decided never to smoke. You can learn from the, the, the sins of the previous generation. Well, I say the sins, but the mistakes, we'll say in that case, because we can't definitively say it's a sin in the scriptures, but we can say it's not a good idea, especially for your health <coughs> and for the, the care of others as well. I mean, if we're, I don't know how many times in the old days where they, remember they used to have in the restaurants smoking and non-smoking, you know, you go in, you sit down in the non-smoking section. What just so happens that you're the last table in the non-smoking section. And right on the other side of the little divider, there's the smoking section. And the smoke just kind of wafts over and you're trying to eat. And, it's, you know, and to me, it's... Yeah, but but uh, sometimes children can learn from that. Sometimes a child sees the, uh, their parents commit sins and they, and they say, I, I don't want that to be my... Well, this wasn't the case for Ahaziah. Ahaziah 
followed in the sins of his father. At the very end of 1 Kings, just, just a page over, we find that in verses 51 through 53, it describes Ahaziah. Uh, Ahaziah, the son of Ahab, became king over Israel and Samaria in the 17th year of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, and reigned two years over Israel. He did evil in the sight of the Lord and walked in the way of his father in the, and in the way of his mother, that would be Jezebel, and in the way of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who, ha, who had made Israel sin. For he served Baal and worshipped him and provoked the Lord God of Israel to anger according to all that his father had done. I mean, you stop and think about that. Surely he had to know what went on with his father. I mean, when, when you look at, at the, what we, we, we've gone through the past several Sunday nights when I've preached and looking at the life of, of Elijah, the, we started out with Elijah confronting his father, Ahab, saying there'll be no rain. There was no rain. Uh, then the, the time for rain had come and there's a great challenge on uh, Mount, uh, what's that, Mount Nebo. Um, what's that? Mount Carmel. Yeah, Mount Carmel. There's this great challenge on Mount Carmel. You have the prophets of Baal. Uh, you have the two sacrifices. You have the fire coming down from heaven. You have Elijah executing the prophets of Baal and running before Ahab. It's, it's like a, a great victory parade for Jehovah. And surely Ahaziah, I don't know if he was there, if he was maybe too young or what, but he surely had to hear about it. And then, then you have the other confrontations and, the, and the, the multiple times where his father had to deal with Elijah and found himself in sin and the consequences that came, surely he should have known. I mean, the prophecies that were made against him and they were fulfilled. Well, he decided to follow Baal, follow the false god as his father and mother did. And the, just to say perhaps that the king, and, and I was reading a commentary on, on, by A.W. Pink on this, the king, where he, point, he points out, the king is a reflection of the people. You know, the, the people had witnessed the miracles under Elijah, you know, the fire from heaven and so forth, yet we're told that not a whole lot about any real repentance in the people, except we knew that there were 7,000 who had not bowed the knee to Baal. Out, out of the whole nation, there was 7,000 people. Uh, A.W. Pink says this about the leadership, and I think it's good to, to look into this considering the times that we live in today. The attitude of a nation towards God is to be gauged not so much by the general deportment of its people as by the character of its governors or government. The two, of course, are uh, intimately related. For where a majority of the subjects are pious, in other words, if the people are a pious people, a God-fearing people, they will not tolerate wickedness in high places. And on the other hand, when those who lead and rule set an, ex an evil example, it cannot be expected that those who follow will excel them in righteousness. Now, a righteous and godly nation, in other words, will not tolerate a wicked ruler. Now, we have an example of that in history, a very interesting one uh, with King Charles I. Uh, the King Charles ruled Great Britain during the time of the Puritans and the Puritan age. And the, I mean, everything was affected by, by Puritanism. And he decided, I'm going to go back to Roman Catholicism. He, he, he married a Catholic wife, and he, be, he began to do what he could to, to try to get the nation back. And the people just completely rejected that. And what it did was bring on the English Civil War. And he was deposed and, and beheaded because though he wanted to do what was wicked, the people said, no way. And you had, you had that. Now, but when you have a population that is tolerant of evil, if not thoroughly evil themselves, you can guarantee, especially in our form of government, you can be guaranteed you're going to have evil leadership. You know, that's what we have. I mean, just look at the state of the churches. You know, in the past couple of weeks, we saw the United Methodist Church give its okay for gay marriage, give its okay for the ordination of gay ministers. You uh, have just in the past week and a half, I think, you have the Southern Baptist failing to say, it's wrong to have women pastors. There was a, uh, an amendment to their constitution that, that came up and they actually voted it down. It was, a, it was somewhat of a close vote, but it was, wasn't close enough ever that, that uh, 
and it should have been overwhelming, you know, that the scriptures teach, uh, what, what the scriptures teach is clear, but they decided that at least almost a third of the Southern Baptist Convention, now nah, we don't want to mess with that. We're okay the way it is, despite all of what's going on in our culture. Uh, so you see how the general deportment of the people and, and their ideas come into the leadership in, 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 our, in, our, in, in our, the, our society. Well, what's going on uh, in the, the rulers of, of our country. Uh, wicked rulers, during a time when the people are righteous, will at least restrain their evil to try to please a righteous population. But unrestrained wickedness is a sign of a population that is at least tolerant of evil, if not thoroughly evil. So what does this do? Well, when you go through the scriptures, you run into situations like this, the only solution is judgment. And that's why I, I believe we need to be prepared as a nation. That we are already currently under judgment as a nation, but I believe things are going to get worse. I think they'll get worse economically, get worse politically uh, in our society. As far as the stability of our society, things may get worse. We need to be prepared for that. Because I, uh, just when you look at the scriptures, when the people behave and the rulers do what they do, what they're doing, it's always judgment. Read the book of Judges. You see that the whole way through. The people did right in their own eyes, and God would bring in some type of calamity, some type of enemy come in uh, to take over until they would cry out to the Lord and the Lord would raise up a judge. Uh, so I believe that's what we have here. King Ahaziah was bringing judgment unto the nation. Wicked rulers lead their nations into judgment. And I believe the first indication of, in our text here of judgment was the rebellion of Moab. Uh, Ahab had Moab under control. They, they paid a tribute, a significant tribute. I think it was 100,000 sheep and then wool for an equal number of sheep or something like that uh, that was required to pay to the king. Uh, that He had them under control. But when he died, the Moabites rebelled. I think we have an a indication here of a judgment which was beginning to open up and unfold. In addition to that, you have the king himself falling through a lattice. I'm not sure exactly how that, I mean, you think of a lattice, what, how that would have happened. It might have been something, like maybe a walkway or a porch or something. Maybe he slipped and went through something. Now, I remember a horrible situation uh, that happened to my, my former employer's family. I think it was his father-in-law who was doing some work on his, his deck. It was a rather high. It might have been 15 feet high. He was just doing some work. might have been some cleaning or something. And the postman walked by, and he went to turn around to say hello to the postman, and they didn't know that the railing of this deck was rotten. And the railing gave way. He fell backward and hit his, himself on, on concrete after like a 15-foot drop. He never did recover completely from that. And it's, it's, but horrible things happen like that. Well, it happens here to this king, Ahaziah. Uh, I believe this is a, a judgment. And there's possibilities here. We're not really told this. But it's possible that Ahaziah had an inward superstition or fear of going to, to battle. In, in this case, because remember what happened to his father. Not too long. He'd only been ruling two years. We know that uh, from, from the previous passage we read in, in 1 Kings. So less than two years prior to that, his father had been killed in battle and killed in such a way that he wasn't even in the front lines. He was doing something and an arrow came whizzing in and, kill, and just kills him. So maybe he's thinking, I don't want that to happen to me. And he decides to stay home and of course, what happens when he's, he's at home? He slips and falls, and he is seriously injured. So maybe he was trying to avoid that. Maybe he thought, if I could just stay home from the battle, I can avoid what happened to my father, because he was equally as, as wicked as his father. Now, Stonewall Jackson, when asked how he could stand so firm in the face of enemy fire, that's why he got his name, Stonewall Jackson, replied that the providence of God, in the providence of God, he was just as safe on the battlefield as he was at home in his own bed. And that we should not be careless or presumptuous. We shouldn't do things which would endanger our life, you know, for thrills or unnecessarily. You know, that uh, if you know that, uh, for example, there's a riot going on somewhere, 
maybe you shouldn't get down to give out tracks at that time. You know, it might not be a, uh, there's a, a, a fellow killed doing that uh, during the Los Angeles riots. He said, wow, look at all these people out here. And, and so he went down in, into Los Angeles and he happened to be the wrong race, I think, and ended up getting killed. So we have to use our, our, our heads. But in general, general, generally speaking, in the course of life, we are immortal until God decides our work is done. Now, so whether Ahaziah went to the battle or came home, if, it, if his time was up, his time was up. And that's what we saw here. The king found that there can be just as much danger safe at home as on the battlefield. And, and I think we also have the principle that there is no escape from God's judgment for wickedness for this wicked king. We have a great sin of the king in verse 2. Uh, remember that Ahaz, Ahaziah would have been very familiar with Elijah. He recognized Elijah, if, you'll, if you remember, uh, as we read through our text, he, he knew who he was. He would have been very familiar with, with Elijah, and being the son of Ahab, he would have been familiar with what happened to his father. He certainly would have heard about the fire coming down from heaven and the execution of the prophets of Baal and all those things. With that in mind, what he did in sending messengers to Philistia to inquire of the soothsayers of Beelzebub was inexcusable. Now here you have, within Israel, you have Elijah, and I think at this time we also had Elisha under his tutelage. You have other prophets, as we have other prophets coming in uh, and dealing, as we read, uh, well, we didn't read, but if you read through 1 Kings, you'll see other prophets that are involved in warning the, the kings of different things. There were prophets of God there. They would call upon prophets for advice. This fellow sends to the enemies of Israel, to Ekron, the, the capital of Philistia, the Philistines, and, and wants to know, hey, am I going to recover of this or not? Now, this was a, a horrible sin. There was a great danger, and let me just kind of point this out. I don't think we have a problem with this in our church, but just as a reminder, there is a great danger in fortune-telling and sorcery. You know, we think, oh, we live in modern times. People don't get involved in that. I mean, uh, folks, as... The church wanes as the church goes down. I mean, look, I mean, we, we have a little handful of people here this evening. Now we have maybe 35, 40, sometimes 50 people here. Out of this popular, I mean, there should be, there's, we should have a, a packed church here. We don't. People are busy doing other things. But what happens whenever they walk away from the things of God and the, and the concept, the conscience of God begins to depart from the population, you know, from the generation? They're spiritual people. Whether they, they realize it or not, they are made to worship. They begin seeking other things, and the occult begins popping up. You know, I, I was driving by Applebee's, and if you want to have your, your tarot cards read, they'll read tarot cards for you. Just knock on the lady's door. You know, uh, I, we, Tammy and I went to uh, Berkeley Springs. We're, we were taking stops on the way back from South Carolina. That's a real quaint little town. There's uh, the springs are there, and they have this little bathtub that made of rock, and, they, and it said that George Washington would stop there uh, to refresh himself, and it's called Washington's Tub or something like that. Maybe some of you have been there. And we're walking around just because just we have to walk to, while we're traveling so and that we don't have difficulties. The older you get, the more you have to do stuff like that. I'm finding out. Uh, I would try driving. I would, I'm going to go and go and go, and I drive. And then I realized I can't walk when I get out of the car, and my leg won't move anymore. Now, so we decided no more of that. I'm not going to do any marathon stuff. We're going to stop. Well, we stopped. And we're walking and we see the stores. There was a store with a gay pride flag or a tea, little tea shop and it talked about some weird spiritual stuff. And then there's actual cult stuff you can buy. It's a couple of different stores. This little tiny town in West, West Virginia. Why? Because the culture has left the true God and when you leave the true God, all that's left is what the Satan is going to provide. You know, so now that's what we have here, and that's a danger for us. You know, some people might think, oh, it's just harmless entertainment. It's just a bunch of fun, a little bit of fun. Uh, but it is strictly forbidden in the Scriptures. 
You know, that uh, you go through the scripture, sorcery, fortune telling is all forbidden. And it's forbidden, I believe, with capital punishment involved. That's how serious it is. And when I was little, my, my mother, you know, she was hanging around some friends, and I don't think they're that, that good, good of an influence on her. But they decided, a bunch of uh, ladies, young, young, she probably was in her 30s at the time, uh, let's go to the fortune teller. So they take their turns there. My mother sits down, you know, and now she was a professing Christian and all that, but she's following along. And this fortune teller starts to talk to her and says, you live on a lane that goes up a hill and your driveway comes out almost like this. You know. And there's trucks that come down this lane. And she says, yeah, yeah. Your son is going to be killed by one of these trucks. And she lived in fear after that because... According to them, I was going to get killed because I was always riding my bike down. There. Now, how did they? Know, how did that woman know that? Uh, there, there are familiar spirits, and these familiar spirits can give information like that. I mean, they have networks of information just like we do. Now, we in the old days we had the telegraph. You know, we'd send information from one place to another. We have uh, now we have the internet. We have uh, all kinds of stuff now. Information flows. You think they don't have ways of? of conveying information between demons and, and their, their helpers in the human world? Of course they do. I believe that's what, what happened there. Uh, it is something that is strictly forbidden by God. And it, it is always connected to the judgment of God. Now this was the final straw, if you remember, in the life of King Saul. Remember King Saul had forsaken the Lord. He had tried to murder David. Uh, he had decided to, to take over the priestly job and and offer sacrifice on his own, not waiting for Samuel. I mean, all the things that Saul did, the murders that he committed. And then finally, when the Lord had forsaken him and he was faced with a dilemma, what do I do in this battle? How do I, how do, I do this? He went to the witch of Endor. And the witch of Endor, he said, and what, what, what do you want, Saul? Uh, can you call up Samuel for me? I need Samuel. And so, whether it was a demon or the actual Samuel, there's a bunch of debate about that. I personally don't believe it was Samuel. I think it was a demon impersonating Samuel. Samuel comes up and says that uh, tomorrow you're going to be with me. You're going to die. You know, so that was the last straw, and he died. I think that the demon simply knew that because he was at that point and, and had that information, I believe, in the spirit world. But it's always connected to judgment. Isaiah 8:19. And when they say to you, seek those who are mediums and wizards and whisper and mutter, should not a people seek their God? Should they seek the dead on behalf of the living? We have this warning, and I think we need to take heed. Don't play games with it. I think it needs to be condemned. I need, it needs to be avoided, especially by God's people. And if you know somebody that's involved in that, I would, I would warn them strongly and, and, and uh, turn them to the Lord. Uh, we have then the judgment on Ahaziah, verse 3 uh, through 4. And I'm just going to try to make this brief. But Ahaziah, and we already read the scripture, as he sends these messengers to uh, go to the fortune tellers in Ekron, they're met by Elijah. Elijah gives them that message. And this message is, is told three times in this chapter. Uh, you are going to die. Why did you go... When there's a God, is there not a God in Israel that you went to Philist, the Philistines to Beelzebub of all the gods? I mean, the Lord of the flies. And, and this fellow was so bad that when it's carried over to the New Testament, Beelzebub is the term for Satan. You know, so uh, that's how bad this was. Why did you go there when there was a God in Israel that you're not coming down from that bed? You're going to die. And that was said three times. And that was the judgment that was declared upon Ahaziah. Israel was supposed to be the place that knew and worshipped the one true God. They had the word of God. They had the priesthood. They had the temple. They had everything there that God wanted to present the truth to the world. But instead, you have the very king of Israel. Of course, it had split into two kingdoms at that time. But the king of the, of, of the northern kingdom is going to seek counsel from another god. And the king is given the pronounce, to pronounce that you shall surely die. Now, now, under normal circumstances, knowing all that Ahaziah knew, especially dealing with his father and experiencing what he did with his father, he should have fallen on his face in repentance and said, I have done wrong, I have done evil. 
uh, Elijah, pray for God to have mercy upon me. But is that what he did? No, his heart was hard. He, he reminds me of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, where you have the frogs and the lice and the boils and the hail and all of that. And he still sits there. Oh, no, I'm not letting the people go. It wasn't until you have the, the firstborn killed in Egypt that he says, get out of here. So his heart is being hardened continually. I believe that there would have been an opportunity to repent, and it was an excellent time to repent, but sin at some point turns to madness. I think that's what we have here. I think this particular king, and we see it, God gives them up to a reprobate mind, a mind given over to insanity, spiritual insanity. And that's what we have. Rather than repent, he hardens his heart. And so what does he do? Instead of calling for Elijah in repentance, he sends the military after the prophet. And he sends a captain with 50 men. Now, 50 men, isn't that, uh, Barry, is that a platoon? Okay, that's about a platoon of, of men. So you have this captain and then a, about a platoon of men that comes out to get the prophet and bring the prophet back to the king. If you'll notice how this go, goes in um, uh, verse 9, the king sent to him a captain of 50 with his 50 men, so he went up to him, and there he was sitting on top of a hill. There's Elijah was sitting on top of a hill, probably knowing what was going to happen here. And he spoke to him. This, this captain said, Man of God, the king has said, Come down. Now, we don't have the inflection. We don't know how it was said, but we can go from the context that this, this fellow didn't believe that Elijah was really a man of God. He was saying this in a derisive term. He was saying this in a mocking term. Hey, man of God. Hey, preacher boy. The king says to come right now. Well, maybe not right now. That comes later. The king says to come. So the, the, the whole context here is that you have this, this captain, the authority of the state, and when you have 50 armed men, they can do a lot of damage. I don't know if you've ever noticed what, what 50 men with swords could do to, to one man. I mean, it's uh, unspeakable what the damage they could do. Uh, so there's a lot of authority being sent here, and a lot of potential for violence. And Elijah call, says down to them, you know what, if I am a man of God, as you say, let fire come down from heaven consume you and of course the Lord now the, the Lord's this wasn't something Elijah was saying oh they really upset me I'm going to get them and I'll call no Elijah couldn't call fire from heaven as any more than we could it was the hand of God God's name was was being blasphemed and God sent fire down from heaven burns these people up and surely word got back to the king the king sends another how hard can a person's heart get Another 50 men with a captain just as obstinate as the first one. Uh, I'm off my notes. I have no idea where I am. Let me see here. Let's see. Yeah, was, okay, here we go. And this fellow not only says that, O man of God, the king says, come, but come down quickly. The king is tired of waiting for you. Get down here. And Elijah says, hey, if I'm a man of God, let fire come down from heaven. Boom, there we go. Another 50 burned to a crisp. I actually titled the sermon. I didn't put it in the bulletin because I, I messed things up. Uh, Elijah and the Crispy Captains. You know, that's two, <laughs> two of them burnt to a crisp. You can imagine the, I mean, the, how, what 50 men would look like in a situation like that when the fire of God falls upon them. So what does the king do? Maybe the king said, oh, you know, I should probably get things... He sends another 50 men. Except this time, I believe there was one of God's elect involved. That This captain perhaps was one of those men who feared God. One of those 7,000 that hadn't bowed their knee to Baal. And when he comes, he falls down on his knees and begs for his life. Understanding the power of God and the respect that he shows to the man of God. In verses 13 and 14. You know, an inter interesting note here, the disciples remembered this passage when dealing with the Samaritans. You know, this is in the same area where, where the, the Samaritans came out and they, were, they, they began to reject Jesus because he had his face set to go to Jerusalem and they were upset about that. 
and his disciples said, Lord, do, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? The Lord said, this is Luke chapter 9, verse 54. When, he, when his disciples, James and John, saw this, James and John, weren't they called the thun, sons of thunder, I think? This is why. <laughs> Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, just as Elijah did? But he turned and rebuked them and said, You do not know what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. Now, so what happened here, I think we have a picture, is not the rule of the day. You know, whenever somebody comes out against us, and uh, the state comes out to arrest us, you know, we're for, for doing what's right, you know, or for maybe opposing what's wrong. We are not to command fire from heaven and destroy them. You know, we're not to grab our AR-15. You know, we're not to do all that stuff. You know, now, there's a whole different story. There does come a time when sometimes you have to defend yourself from an evil government, but uh, you'll know when that time is, if that, if that comes, and how to do it. But we as individuals are to do that. We're not to be calling fire down from heaven. Our Lord tells us what to do. We're to speak uh, the truth and the power of the Holy Spirit, and he will do the convicting, and uh, he will bring the appropriate judgment or re appropriate repentance, however he decides. But we're not to be calling down fire from heaven. But regardless, this third captain came and was told uh, that uh, Elijah was told by the Lord, the angel of the Lord, to go down with him. He then again proclaims this message to the king, uh, the message, of course, was that the king would not come down from this bed. He was going to die. Uh, but while he was there, can you imagine this? He's, he's, uh, the king was trying to get him down, and the king wanted uh, to do no good to him. He, I'm sure he wanted to harm Elijah. But when Elijah came, there was such fear that I believe came upon them that they couldn't raise a hand against him. Now, you, you see that happening with the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, uh, whenever the crowd came out, I think they were going to try to throw him off a cliff. And he walks through the midst of the, they're, they're probably so angry but they were just frozen by something they, they just couldn't lift a hand against him I think that's what we have here the spirit of God would not allow them to harm Elijah he went in gave his message and then he left uh, he, he served the Lord in complete safety uh, and then we find that the word of the Lord came to pass in verse 17 uh, in the uh, first part of that. And uh, so Ahaziah died according to the word of the Lord which Elijah had spoken. Uh, so whenever the word of the Lord is given, we can be assured that it will come to pass, just as our Lord taught us, Matthew chapter 5, verse 18. For surely I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law until all is fulfilled. Luke 16, 17, it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one tittle of the law to fail. So we can rest assured that all the promises and prophecies of Scripture are certain to be fulfilled. And, and let me say, I, I'm not a prophet. I'm not a, 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 an end times preacher. You know, I don't get up. You, you know that. I, I don't get up and, and talk about the Lord returning all the time. But I, I do think that we need to, spay, to pay careful attention to our times in the, in the case that we're living in. Because the Bible does talk about a great apostasy. You know, and I think that we may be living in that time of great apostasy. It also talks about a time when uh, Satan is going to be loose for a season. And we're thinking, what's going on here? Uh, is this the fulfillment of prophecy? I don't know. I mean, I'm not going to say Jesus is coming. You know, be, uh, he may be. I don't know. But I think we need to be ready. I think we need to look at, at our times and consider that, Lord, if this is the time, help me to be prepared for that time when you return. Help me to be serving you. Give me uh, strength and, and uh, give me spiritual awareness uh, that I might better serve you for the time is short. The return of the Lord may be soon. We, I mean, we don't know. Uh, but we need to look up and prepare for that final great prophecy, the prophecy of his return. It was prophesied that he returns. The angels themselves prophesied the return of Christ. Whenever he was ascending up into heaven, they said he's coming back in the same way. It's happening. It's going to happen someday. We need to be prepared for it. With that in mind, let us go to prayer.